Section 53 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 53. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Doctor, I have now reached the northern extremity of England, and see, close to my chamber window, the Tweed gliding through the arches of that bridge which connects this suburb to the town of Berwick. Yorkshire you have seen, and therefore I shall say nothing of that opulent province. The city of Durham appears like a confused heap of stones and brick, accumulated so as to cover a mountain, round which a river winds its brawling course. The streets are generally narrow, dark, and unpleasant, and many of them almost impassable in consequence of their declivity. The cathedral is a huge gloomy pile, but the clergy are well lodged. The bishop lives in a princely manner, the golden prevens keep plentiful tables, and I am told there is some good sociable company in the place, but the country, when viewed from the top of Gateshead Fell, which extends to Newcastle, exhibits the highest scene of cultivation that ever I beheld. As for Newcastle, it lies mostly in a bottom on the banks of the Tyne, and makes an appearance still more disagreeable than that of Durham. But it is rendered populous and rich by industry and commerce, and the country lying on both sides of the river above the town yields a delightful prospect of agriculture and plantation. Morpeth and Alnwick are neat, pretty towns, and this last is famous for the castle which has belonged to so many ages to the noble house of Piercy, earls of Northumberland. It is doubtless a large edifice, containing a great number of apartments, and stands in a commanding situation, but the strength of it seems to have consisted not so much in its site, or the manner in which it is fortified, as in the valour of its defendants. Our adventures since we left Scarborough are scarce worth reciting, and yet I must make you acquainted with my sister Tabby's progress in husband-hunting, after her disappointments at Bath and London. She had actually begun to practise upon a certain adventurer, who was in fact a highwayman by profession, but he had been used to snares much more dangerous than any she could lay, and escaped accordingly. Then she opened her batteries upon an old weather-beaten Scotch lieutenant called Miss Mahago, who joined us at Durham, and is, I think, one of the most singular personages I ever encountered. His manner is as harsh as his countenance, but his peculiar turn of thinking and his pack of knowledge made up of the remnants of rarities rendered his conversation desirable, in spite of his pedantry and ungracious address. I have often met with a crab-apple in a hedge, which I have been tempted to eat for its flavour, even while I was disgusted by its austerity. The spirit of contradiction is naturally so strong in Les Mahago, that I believe in my conscience he has rummaged and read and studied with indefatigable attention, in order to qualify himself to refute established maxims, and thus raise trophies for the gratification of polemical pride. Such is the asperity of his self-conceit, that he will not even acquiesce in a transient compliment made to his own individual in particular, or to his country in general. When I observed that he must have read a vast number of books to be able to discourse on such a variety of subjects, he declared he had read little or nothing, and asked how he should find books among the woods of America where he had spent the greatest part of his life. My nephew remarking that the Scots in general were famous for their learning, he denied the imputation, and defied him to prove it from their works. The Scots, said he, have a slight tincture of letters, with which they make a parade among people who are more illiterate than themselves, but they may be said to float on the surface of science, and they have made very small advances in the useful arts. At least, cried Tabby, all the world allows that the Scots behaved gloriously in fighting and conquering the savages of America— "'I can assure you, madam, you have been misinformed,' replied the lieutenant. "'In that continent the Scots did nothing more than their duty, "'nor was there one corps in His Majesty's service "'that distinguished itself more than another. "'Those who affected to extol the Scots for superior merit "'were no friends to that nation. "'Though he himself made free with his countrymen, "'he would not suffer any other person "'to glance a sarcasm at them with impunity. "'One of the company, chancing to mention Lord B.'s, inglorious peace, the lieutenant immediately took up the cudgels in his lordship's favour, and argued very strenuously to prove that it was the most honourable and advantageous peace that England had ever made since the foundation of the monarchy. Nay, between friends, he offered such reasons on this subject, that I was really confounded, if not convinced. 
he would not allow that the Scots abounded above their proportion in the army and navy of Great Britain, or that the English had any reason to say his countrymen had met with extraordinary encouragement in the service. "'When a South and North Britain,' said he, "'are competitors for a place or commission, which is in the disposal of an English minister or an English general, it would be absurd to suppose that the preference will not be given to the native of England, who has so many advantages over his rival.' First and foremost, he has in his favour that laudable partiality which, Mr. Addison says, never fails to cleave to the heart of an Englishman. Secondly, he has more powerful connections and a greater share of parliamentary interest, by which those contests are generally decided. And lastly, he has a greater command of money to smooth the way to his success. For my own part, said he, I know no Scotch officer who has risen in the army above the rank of a subaltern, without purchasing every degree of preferment, either with money or recruits. But I know many gentlemen of that country who, for want of money and interest, have grown grey in the rank of lieutenants, whereas very few instances of this ill-fortune are to be found among the natives of South Britain. Not that I would insinuate that my countrymen have the least reason to complain. Preferment in the service, like success in any other branch of traffic, will naturally favour those who have the greatest stock of cash and credit, merit and capacity being supposed equal on all sides. But the most hardy of all this original's positions were these, that commerce would sooner or later prove the ruin of every nation where it flourishes to any extent, that the Parliament was the rotten part of the British Constitution, that the liberty of the press was a national evil, and that the boasted institution of juries, as managed in England, was productive of shameful perjury and flagrant injustice. He observed that traffic was an enemy to all the liberal passions of the soul, founded on the thirst of lucre, a sordid disposition to take advantage of the necessities of our fellow creatures. He affirmed the nature of commerce was such that it could not be fixed or perpetuated, but having flowed to a certain height, would immediately begin to ebb, and so continue till the channels should be left almost dry. But there was no instance of the tides rising a second time to any considerable influx in the same nation. Meanwhile, the sudden affluence occasioned by trade forced open all the sluices of luxury and overflowed the land with every species of profligacy and corruption. A total pravity of manners would ensue, and this must be attended with bankruptcy and ruin. He observed of the Parliament that the practice of buying boroughs and canvassing for votes was an avowed system of venality, already established on the ruins of principle, integrity, faith, and good order, in consequence of which the elected and the elector and, in short, the whole body of the people, were equally and universally contaminated and corrupted. He affirmed that of a Parliament thus constituted, the Crown would always have influence enough to secure a great majority in its dependence, from the great number of posts, places, and pensions it had to bestow, that such a Parliament would, as it had already done, lengthen the term of its sitting and authority, whenever the Prince should think it for his interest to continue the representatives, for without doubt, they had the same right to protect their authority ad infinitum, as they had to extend it from three to seven years. With a Parliament therefore dependent upon the Crown, devoted to the Prince, and supported by a standing army, garbled and modelled for the purpose, any King of England may, and probably some ambitious sovereign will, totally overthrow all the bulwarks of the Constitution, for it is not to be supposed that a Prince of high spirit will tamely submit to be thwarted in all his measures abused and insulted by a populace of unbridled ferocity, when he has it in his power to crush all opposition under his feet with the concurrence of the legislature. He said he should always consider the liberty of the press as a national evil, while it enabled the vilest reptile to soil the lustre of the most shining merit, and furnished the most infamous incendiary with the means of disturbing the peace and destroying the good order of the community. He owned, however, that under due restrictions it would be a valuable privilege— but affirmed that at present there was no law in England sufficient to restrain it within proper bounds. With respect to juries, he expressed himself to this effect. Juries are generally composed of illiterate plebeians, apt to be mistaken, easily misled, and open to sinister influence. For if either of the parties to be tried can gain over one of the twelve jurors, he has secured the verdict in his favour. The jurymen thus brought over will, in despite of all evidence and conviction, generally hold out till his fellows are fatigued and harassed and starved into concurrence, in which case the verdict is unjust and the jurors are all perjured. But cases will often occur when the jurors are really divided in opinion, and each side is convinced in opposition to the other. 
but no verdict will be received unless they are unanimous, and they are all bound, not only in conscience, but by oath, to judge and declare according to their conviction. What, then, will be the consequence? They must either starve in company, or one side must sacrifice their conscience to their convenience, and join in a verdict which they believe to be false. This absurdity is avoided in Sweden, where a bare majority is sufficient, and in Scotland, where two-thirds of the jury are required to concur in the verdict. You must not imagine that all these deductions were made on his part without contradictions on mine. No, the truth is, I found myself piqued in point of honour at his pretending to be so much wiser than his neighbours. I questioned all his assertions, started innumerable objections, argued and wrangled with uncommon perseverance, and grew very warm and even violent in the debate. Sometimes he was puzzled, and once or twice, I think, fairly refuted, but from those falls he rose again like Antaeus with redoubled vigour, till at length I was tired, exhausted, and really did not know how to proceed, when, luckily, he dropped a hint, by which he discovered he had been bred to the law, a confession which enabled me to retire from the dispute with a good grace, as it could not be supposed that a man like me, who had been bred to nothing, should be able to cope with a veteran in his own profession. I believe, however, that I shall for some time continue to chew the cut of reflection upon many observations which this original discharged. Whether our sister Tabby was really struck with this conversation, or is resolved to throw at everything she meets in the shape of a man till she can fasten the matrimonial noose, certain it is she has taken desperate strides toward the affection of Lishmahago, who cannot be said to have met her half-way, though he does not seem altogether insensible to her civilities. She insinuated more than once how happy we should be to have his company through that part of Scotland which we proposed to visit, till at length he plainly told us that his road was totally different from that which we intended to take, that for his part his company would be of very little service to us in our progress, as he was utterly unacquainted with the country which he had left in his early youth. Consequently, he could neither direct us in our inquiries nor introduce us to any family of distinction." He said he was stimulated by an irresistible impulse to revisit the patronus lar or patria domus, though he expected little satisfaction, inasmuch as he understood that his nephew, the present possessor, was but ill qualified to support the honour of the family. He assured us, however, as we designed to return by the west road, that he will watch our motions and endeavour to pay his respects to us at Dumfries. Accordingly he took his leave of us at a place half-way betwixt Morpeth and Alnwick, and pranced away in great state, mounted on a tall, meagre, raw-boned, shambling, grey gelding, without e'er a tooth in his head, the very counterpart of the rider, and indeed the appearance of the two was so picturesque that I would give twenty guineas to have them tolerably presented on canvas. Northumberland is a fine county, extending to the Tweed, which is a pleasant pastoral stream, but you will be surprised when I tell you that the English side of the river is neither so well cultivated nor so populous as the other. The farms are thinly scattered, the lands unenclosed, and scarce a gentleman's seat is to be seen in some miles from the Tweed, whereas the Scots are advanced in crowds to the very brink of the river, so that you may reckon above thirty good houses in the compass of a few miles, belonging to proprietors whose ancestors had fortified castles in the same situations, a circumstance that shews what dangerous neighbours the Scots must have formerly been to the northern counties of England. Our domestic economy continues on the old footing. My sister Tabby still adheres to Methodism, and had the benefit of a sermon at Wesley's meeting in Newcastle. But I believe the passion of love has, in some measure, abated the fervour of devotion, both in her and her woman, Mrs. Jenkins, about whose good graces there has been a violent contest betwixt my nephew's valet, Mr. Dutton, and my man, Humphrey Clinker. Jerry has been obliged to interpose his authority to keep the peace, and to him I have left the discussion of that important affair which had like to have kindled the flames of discord in the family of yours always, Matt Bramble, Tweedmouth, July 15. End of section 53